Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. You have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Hey everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm watching you all on Restream. I did not set up a clubhouse just yet. I think I will do that in just a second. Uh, reminder, tomorrow Vinny Tortorich comes on in. He, of course, has uh, got a new documentary that rather extraordinary about impossible meat. And uh, let me get the, the uh, clubhouse going here. Uh, and he um, actually is having great results with that, with that documentary. He himself narrates much of it. It's not so much interview with other folks like me as he did in Fat, which also was a successful documentary for him. But uh, the impossible meat exploration turns out to be very, very interesting, and much more than you might imagine. So I am setting up a room over on uh, Clubhouse. You can join us there and ask questions of our guest, who is Stuart Pierce. Stuart is um, a unique master of voice, public speaking and performance coach. He has a book, Diana, The Voice of Change, about Princess Diana. Uh, and her life principles. You can find out more about Stuart at Stuart Pierce, P E A R C E dot com. He has coached, seems like everybody, uh, religious leaders, actors, celebrities of all type. And uh, that'd be very interesting what he's got to say today. Uh, it was apparently Diana's greatest desire through her example that each woman of the world would find their own authentic voice. So, who better than somebody who specializes in voice? Stuart Pierce, welcome to the program. Hi there. There you Good are. Good to meet you. Through, huh? Good to meet you too. And, and I've I've noticed uh, <laughs> in the presence of a a vocal coach and teacher, I immediately slow down and start watching my diction and become self aware. I'm and not I, talking. And I thought to myself, I thought, man, you should see how I behave around my French teacher. I get even worse. Get more nervous and more and more self conscious. So I, I'm sure it may be the case that I'll be speaking differently than I normally do. But welcome to the program. Well, bless you. Thank you for coming. And may I just add something to your introduction? Because it sounds as yes, though sir. my book is a commentary mm -hmm. on somebody on the outside of me called Princess Diana. And actually, the book is about the two years that I spent with Diana as her confidant and her vocal coach, the last two years of her life when we saw her go through this remarkable transformation. Ah, oh, there's the book. So it's actually it about the essence of Diana. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not a chronicle. It's not a court circular. It actually goes into who was she and what was all that about? I have two sort of already initial uh, thoughts, one and questions. One was uh, her vocal delivery is something I always admired, particularly after she left the palace. I mean, she really was at an uncanny uh, command at the podium. Yeah, I figured it, I'm figuring it's something to do with you. So you're going to, you're going to help me do command the same, uh, number one. And number <laughs> two, I'm wondering if you've gotten any pushback from the palace and from the Royal family since you've uh, put the book out. No, not at all. No, they, they, they've, um, been tacit, but extremely approving from what I gather. In other words, it has not been overt. It never is the response to the nature of the book, but I've heard through people who are, you know, not necessarily the men in gray suits that Diana used to call the firm, but a number of people within the household. Um, yeah, no, I've had some really, really good responses, not from the British press, from the American press, from the US press. It's been absolutely amazing, but not from the, um, the British press, unfortunately. And help us understand why that might be. Well, there is at the moment uh, a huge furor, as we know, about the defection, <laughs> as the British press would see it, of Harry and Meghan back to Los Angeles, to her home. Um, I think it's most unfortunate that that's been the way that it has. But they were absolutely vitriolic about her, her status within the British royal family. And so um, bearing in mind that they're both people who live through the essence of transparency, bearing in mind that they've been through a number of years 
of really in-depth psychotherapeutic interaction that, that obviously t transparency, resolution and resurrection are very much their thing. And so they step forward and they're very transparent about what was taking place. And the British press have not liked that. And you said, uh, you mentioned psychotherapeutics. So so he, they both have been in treatment or they were in couples therapy or all of the above? What, what, what do we know about they, what that well, they were both They were both in individual therapy. I mean, that was, you know, the whole story mm -hmm. that came up in the interview between Oprah, Meghan, and then Harry was the fact that uh, Harry was experiencing unusual moods to do with the suppression of anger, mm -hmm. that he was, you know, held mm -hmm. within this conflict of grief for many, many, many years, could not rationalize why the rest of the world was able to weep, where he was not able to weep for the lamentation of his dear mother passing. And uh, so he's been extraordinarily honest about all of that process. And it really does color, not just simply the way he's thinking, but also the way he's feeling. Yeah, unresolved grief uh, and trauma, frankly, because having the mom taken so so abruptly and in a violent way that 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 is traumatic for a young man. And so back to Diana, uh, I, I almost don't know where to start. How, how you, you take us through this? Well, help us understand what you understand and what we'll learn by reading the book. Well, Diana was one of the most extraordinary people that I've met, and you've already given a, a feeling of the fact that I've actually worked quite comprehensively over the last 40, nearly 50 years as a voice coach. I'm slightly older than I look. Diana was one of the most honest, one of the most loving, one of the most caring, one of the most empathic people that I've ever met. A gentle, gentle soul who wore her heart on her sleeve um, and experienced huge difficulties as an empath. Because as we know, there is a revolution of empathic uh, intelligence taking place in the moment in the sense that empaths are stepping forward and revealing who they truly are. And she had great difficulty expressing the totality of her being, particularly in relation to the establishment. Because within the establishment, there was a certain form of behavior that you had to adhere to. And uh, her form of behavior was to be honest and expressive rather than hiding emotion or aloofing herself from difficult emotional situations. Um, so uh, unfortunately, the, the establishment gave her a really, really rough ride as she was trying to seek the approval of a patriarchal witness in the form of Big Daddy. Um, she found it really difficult. And of course, one of, the biggest, one of the biggest patriarchal vessels that we have in the British royal family is the dear queen herself. She may be matriarchal, but she is still representing the establishment of the patriarchy. And the Queen was, of course, very, very kind to Diana. It was just the, the Diana, when she tried to explore the challenges that she uh, experienced in being married to Prince Charles, because it was pretty obvious in the very beginning that his affection for her was less than his, her affection for him, that she found it very mm -hmm. bewildering as a woman to process all of that information. You packed a lot into what you've just said. I want to unpack a little bit of it. Uh, what do you mean by empathic intelligence? Uh, Drew, is there any way that I... Oh, great. It's great to see you. If I'm looking at myself, it's uh, it suddenly becomes really unfocused. Um, well, you know, we have expo ex experienced 450 years of accentuation of the cerebral intelligence where mathematics or indeed... Um, the, the, the mechanistic uh, perspective of the world has become the forthright concern in relation to the way that we use our consciousness. And there are some of us who find it difficult to engage in the mechanistic, but we tend to have a very awakened right brain or creative or intuitive nature. And Diana was one of these. So she often referred to herself as being as thick as two short planks, which was not the case. It's just that she was thinking and feeling in a very different way from the establishment. So what uh, one neuroscientist out here calls Descartes' error, separating the mind and the body, and that we now Absolutely. understand that, that these things, these things, this is one system. And then, and then you used a word, I, I hope you don't mind me unpacking this, because it, it's it fascinating to me, uh, aloofing. You used the term aloofing. Is, is that something mm -hmm. that the royal family just does as a way of just getting, getting on with things? Well, as we all know, you know, when emotional 
temperament is shown, whether it be somebody who's deeply moved by and is crying, if you're uncomfortable by that, if you're embarrassed by that, if you don't feel that you know what to do with that behavior, automatically, if you're living through the sort of protocol that the people that we're describing live through, then you switch off from it. And, and that's effectively what we saw happening with Prince Charles. He switched off from it. And, and, and is that a uniquely British move? It, it, you know, it's sort of character-like, uh, cartoon-like in terms of how people see you know, British and the, some of their personality styles. It, it feels like something that people would accuse the British generally of. A, a my question, is that accurate? And B, is that changing if it's accurate? Well, to move anti-chronologically, I think it's changing. <laughs> and my experience is, my right. feeling is that it's changing. You know, I've been teaching public speaking skills for 40 years, both in the US and in the UK. And to be quite frank, I haven't experienced behavioral difficulties b between both the English, you know, being more reserved or more shy and the American speakers that I've worked with. You guys live on a vast continent, and as a result of that, you have a lot of energy in your, in your energy fields. So you are able to express yourselves very freely. This, this is um, in the United Kingdom, as you know, at the moment in the city of London. This is a very small island in comparison. So we tend to be more precise with our social parameters. And of course, we, we were not a country of discovery in relation to the great mass of the United States of America. Uh, growing from really the middle part of the 19th century. This country has been going for a very long time. I mean, we look at the British yeah. monarchy in itself, yeah. it's a thousand years old. So it's, it's yeah, steeped yeah. in tradition, steeped in patriarchy, steeped in heritage. And uh, that formulates a certain way of being. I, I want to get back to the patriarchy. That was the other word I wanted to unpack, but I, I've got to do a quick aside here. There's a <laughs> book I've referenced on this show before called Albion Seed about the three regions of Britain that the predominant uh, immigration was uh, in the early days of this country. There's Albion Seed. And, um, mm. and when I hear you talk about the reservedness and the difference here, uh, let's, be, <laughs> let's be fair and honest. A, a lot of the immigrants were from Northern e England and Scotland. They were essentially wildlings. Uh, that's a lot of us. And, and the rest were people who were eh, the, the top a couple of percentile of the less emotionally healthy necessarily who thought it was a great idea to get on a boat and go go to America and face unknown risks. I, I'm just saying we, we, we set ourselves up to have a certain quality about us, I think, uh, from who, who chose to come here from your little island. Mm. It's an interesting thought. It's never really occurred to me, to be honest, because when we move into the maverick spirit of liberation, for example, most of those people, as we know, were running away from disassociation or a lack of social emancipation, or maybe they were being herded as a result of religious prejudice. And so when we get on a boat and we sail for six months across a very stormy Atlantic and then arrive on the west yeah. coast of the, yeah. uh, the east coast, rather, of the United, in the United States, or the colony states at least, our being changes. What was not changing was the amount of religious conduct that was kept that kept the people at bay, and of course the lack of appreciation of the native peoples of the United States of America. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. That was. Uh, oh, we're still um, trying to contend with that as best we can. So back to the unparking, unpacking patriarchy. I, I'm wondering. I'm guessing that term is sort of experienced a little differently than it is here. Uh, here, it it has a very um, when when people. My daughter's someone that has a very um, inclusive view of patriarchy and what it has done, uh, and it's not exactly uh, kind or not. Let them, Clement, I guess, would probably be the better word. Um, is, is there anything redeeming about it in Britain because it has had this deep connection with your historical heritage? Well, there are two. I think it also applies to the question that you answered me just now about the royal family. Why are they different from everybody else? That um, the, the patriarchal establishment 
is really an organism, a social organism that exists beyond the people that we're talking about. And that's been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries. And it's to do with the way that mm. uh, the governing principles of our, of our different nations are actually um, organized. And of course, as we know, they're largely led by men. And men think in a certain way and women think in another way. As John Gray showed us in his book, you know, women are from Venus and men are from Mars. Um, but, you know, just common sense tells us that that's different. What, what we're also you're, you're not allowed in this country, in this country, you're, you're, you're not allowed to say that anymore. The, the way that that's considered sexist and, uh, and what they call a biological essentialism and it's all society. Now it's all, when it comes to human behavior, as somebody who's worked with human behavior for decades, it's of course always both, but right now the political winds in this country, you're not, you're considered a biological essentialist. If you send say men are from Mars, women are from Venus. So I was just talking about a book that was emitted <laughs> 20 years ago, yes, that's all, right, right. Uh, which is a really interesting right, book. Go. And actually, inter apropos Diana, it was the book that I actually gave her as a vacation gift in August of 1997, which she took with her. And I remember her saying, if anything, if anything happens that is untoward, I will always have a sign for you. And what was interesting is that when I saw the documentary of both Dodie and Diana, moving from the Ritz uh, Salon, where they were staying, to the elevator, the famous, rather historic documentary that we know, know about, you know, that filmic sequence of how they got into the car and then shut off from the Ritz. Yeah. But there was the book on the side table. So that's why it sort of pops into my consciousness. But, you know, oh, hey, goodness. I'm a great supporter. Wow. I'm a, I'm a great supporter of the divine feminine. So as you can see from my CV, most of the people that I've worked with over the years have been extraordinary ladies, starting with my big break. And that was Margaret Thatcher. Now there was a, there I was, was going to say, I, I, I saw Margaret Thatcher on the, on the list and I was like, wow, that is, I, I didn't know whether I should ask about that or not. Cause that seems so extraordinary to me. Let me ask this. Are her recent portrayals, uh, by, um, Oh shoot! Uh, help me, Susan. The this the COVID Meryl, this is to me. Meryl Streep. The, the, Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep. Or, or, for instance, was that an? Do you feel like that was a, a a accurate portrayal? I thought it was superb. Yeah, I mean, for a yeah. docudrama which is full of very similitude and twists and changes truth, I thought it was extraordinary. I mean, Meryl is a consummate. Yeah. From consummate actress, and also the portrayal of, that Gillian gave us in The Crown recently was really extraordinary. Yeah, got to the very so core. We're, so we so Margaret that's nice Brown. to hear because because we we don't know her in this country very well. Although I do remember her uh, from back in the day, and um, it, it's nice to see that we're getting exposed to something accurate about her because she she was an extraordinary person. I I just oh, my my most distinct memories of her were in the what's the the hall that she has to lead as the prime minister house of commons is that or is that just a house. general congress house, no, of it's commons. A house of commons uh and, yeah and, and the the her just her ability to joust uh, at, at from the podium there was just a breathtaking I, how she was able to think like that on her feet i just had this immense admiration for when she would and she would really destroy some of those right honorable gentlemen that she would address uh is did she already have all that when you got a hold of her uh, well i think what you're talking about is the fact that she was a genius so yes i, mean, I, I think that's right that's what i thought I came along. that's what i thought I mean, yeah. she, her level yeah. of articulacy you know and she also was uh she had a photogra photographic memory and so she could read uh, six pages mm. of notes with figures after figures after figures to do with the, um, the exchequer, the land. And she would mm. go in just having mm. read them once mm. and just present them with immense applause. Wow. So there, there was that. I mean, you know, the reason why I was called in was because she had this upper class or upper middle class sound that went rather like this. And it was perceived to be patronizing. And so what they wanted for her to have was a little bit more weight. So what I did was to really introduce her to the gravity of her voice so that she could bowl her voice across the floor of the commons and startle everybody. <laughs> Let's do a little vocal conversation for a minute because I am fascinated by, by the voice. Uh, and uh, 
I will tell you, um, I had lots of vocal training over my time. I, I sang opera briefly, but that, that of course, is a, a different kind of vocal training compared to speaking, and, and I'm aware of that difference. Uh, I presently have a varicosity on my cord, uh, on, I believe my right cord, if I remember right, which uh, hemorrhaged uh, when I and when I tried to sing again recently for a, a television program. It was a problem, <laughs> but I, but it has not really, uh, other than causing some fatigue in my speaking voice, it has not been a problem uh, speaking. And and to repair that, it's a laser surgery and three weeks of complete vocal rest and all this stuff that I'm just not just not doing. Um, any suggestions how to work around that? I, I'm imagining just more air uh, and more head um, in terms of how we think about it, you know, singing, you know, how, how we think about it when we're singing in our singing voice. What would you say about that? Mm. Well, I, f I feel that what you're really talking about is the way that the vocal cords have become tense and have um, restricted themselves from the usual elasticity that's there when um when the voice is very mobile and very free i mean after all your voice is being used as a professional consistently and one of the things that i've noticed about the, the 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 general american speech over the last 25 30 years is the closing of the throat the closing of the yes, pharynx the tightening and so the tightening. what what begins to happen is yeah you know, i mean if i stay in the english dialect what begins to happen is this which is slowly beginning to happen here because of our extraordinary interest in American TV. But if I go into that sort of nasal thing, you know, the back of my mm -hmm. tongue is wrapped right up against the pharynx and the soft palate. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm yep, yep. It and that voice opens. So, what I what I would re recommend you've already said: breath, 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 breath. Mm -hmm. But what's mm -hmm. the quality of? And it seems that there's a, there's a fashion today which is all about breathing deeply into the abdomen. And what I've discovered over the years is that most of the people that come to me, often leading individuals who have a vocal who are vocal casualties, you know, they have some level of disability, a croak or too much phlegm or whatever it is, uh, they're only breathing into the abdomen. And they're what I've discovered over the years is if we open up the rib cage and then feel the diaphragm into the abdomen, the ribs right. work as a support. So the whole of the laryngeal structure remains open, rather like a beautiful crucible. That stops happening and this starts happening. And as a result, yes. the tension goes immediately. Yeah. That's why I begin. Yeah, uh, I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. I'm not sure if everyone does. A lot, most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about their voice, but I suggest that you do. It's, it's something that you're using all the time. You certainly look in the mirror plenty and you're worried about your hair and your skin and our eyes, but we don't think a lot about our voice. And it's, it's, and it requires real work. It doesn't just happen necessarily by itself. It's weird to me how we do get into these strange patterns regionally. Um, it, it's hard to almost understand how it happens, but I guess we're mimetic creatures. Is that primarily how it happens? Yeah, I mean, we're under immense strain at, the, at this time of huge societal change, aren't we? I mean, COVID has been an extraordinary phenomenon that has brought a tremendous fear to the fore. You know, Carl Jung, the great psychoanalyst, said that the, the throat mm -hmm. was the ring of fear. Mm -hmm. And so we're primarily, again, talking mm. about the sphincter muscles in the throat. And of course, as we know, we know that we have sphincter muscles in every single orifice in the body. And when one closes, they all close. So, you know, if we close our throat, then we get this clenched sound coming through like this. So a lot of people are experiencing PTSD as a result of that. Of course, we know that that's brought on for the fact that people are terrified about breathing in case they breathe in the bacteriology of COVID or any of its deviant strains. So, you know, we're under a lot of pressure at the moment. But also, I have to say, you know, having just spent two and a half weeks in this bliss city of mine, New York City, that the level of noise, the level of machine <laughs> noise, and the noise in right. people's consciousnesses in their heads yeah. makes people mm. really push their voices like this. This is the, there's no support. Yeah. But I'm. It's exactly there. right. I love this guy. That uh, is exactly right. That this, is, and, and that's this, that's how you get into trouble. This has changed, though, you know, Dr. Drew. It's changed over the last 30 years. It didn't used to be like this. I mean, my, my first literary agent was a wonderful New Yorker 
who was sort of the doyen of the literati set in, in New York City. And she would say, darling, you will meet me at the St. Pierre at Eight, uh, eight o'clock, I will be drinking a dry martini. I suppose you'll be drinking water. You know, uh, it was this very, very mellifluous, open throated tone. It's something that's happened as a result of the stresses. Um, and of course, you know, uh, having been in, having not been in New York for two years because of COVID, I, I could see how everybody was almost doubled over, both physically and metaphysically, because of the hit in the belly of COVID. You know, I'm going to argue also there was a movement in this country to mark yourself with a more, what was at once time called the mid-Atlantic accent, which was essentially sort of an affected British accent. And now people go to great lengths to avoid marking themselves to seeming mark you know mark zuckerberg sounds like shit when he talks and he wears a hoodie all the time you, you're not you you don't distinguish yourself no matter what strata you come from and i i'm as you're talking i'm thinking yeah people have done that with their voice too i think yeah yeah it's a sum total of all the restrictions all the pressures that are upon us and of course mark must be experiencing a, a certain amount of um, uh, <laughs> perturbation, shall we say, at the moment, because of his yeah, empire yeah. being threatened by government. And so I'm sure, although he seems it, to be happily married and has a wonderful estate on the island, one of the islands of, of Hawaii, that he must be experiencing a great deal of pressure. What's interesting is that he, whenever he speaks, his face hardly ever moves. It's almost as though his yeah, I face know. is he, rigid. I, I know. That's a little troubling. It's, it's called a flat affect. There's, an, there's actually a term, clinical term for that. It worries me a little bit when I see him that way. Um, and, and I want to go back to my own uh, vocal issues. I, all, everything you said was true, but I have, I have a special problem that, again, from a singing standpoint, upper middle range, passaggio, my, my chords won't come together properly because there's a vein there called a varicosity. And so it, it, right. the, the light yeah. chord that needs to be, you have to lighten the chords so they touch just so. And uh, I can't get, it just disappears. It just, it just, I, I just can't do anything. And uh, very disturbing if you're used to having that. So in, in, in your speaking, I mean, you've got this great voice as you speak. Um, because you go, you move right through the very center of your range. So you are using your signature note in the way that you were referring to what I was suggesting about uh, Dear Diana earlier. And that's something that I do. I move around the world and introduce everybody to their signature note. When we find signature note, we find harmony. But I want to go back to what is you it, just shared. Let me interrupt you. So, is, is it actually a note? Is it actually a note? Because I, I, I have a note in my head, which is like about, B flat. I, I, yeah, mine's B flat. Yeah. I can well, tell you what it is. Just, but I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm an yeah. intuitive. I'm not a musician. Ah. And so I won't say well, yeah. it's a C yeah. sharp or it's a B flat or it's an A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, you just it's it, a sound. You know, you, shall I quickly demonstrate? Please, please do. People are yeah. fascinated by this. We don't. We never. You know, things we never get a chance to talk about are always interesting to people. Yeah, your daughter's. Yeah, yeah. she yeah. wants. That, she wants help. <laughs> that um, she the, sounds the, like me. Know, Way back, really, up until the end of the 19th century, we always assess someone's character through their voice. Uh, if we know. go all That's the right. way back in our history, the word persona literally means through sound. And so that, I mean, that's specifically within the Roman context. But Benjamin Disraeli, to sweep forward in, in the chronology of our times, he said that the index of somebody's voice was really the index of a character. Now, I want to spin forward to now because I don't know about you, but on my cell phone, which is an Apple cell phone, I can get into my bank account through my voice identity. So actually, the very core of our voices and the lessons thereof, they're coming back through um, biosecurity. I find that really fascinating. So I feel that is, fascinating. is actually... But the fact that we're really going to be talking more and more and more about the voice, and particularly about our wonderful women as they find their voices and step forward. Hence, my voice, be, uh, my book rather, being called Diana, the Voice of Change. But back to your voice. Yeah, I, so I is it that. Finish up. Sorry. Is that my is that my is pitch? It, is it difficult? Get right there? in there. Is it, is it no. No. Oh, it's right amazing. above that no, is where I, I get into trouble. Oh, so there. 
Yeah, that's 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 I can that feel I can't really get the good. light. Yeah, but not the way I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it feels yeah. very like I'm I'm barely holding it. I feel that if you could keep breathing gently into that and not pushing the sound, that over a period of mm -hmm. say two months, mm -hmm. you'd get back into the level of elasticity that you were used to experiencing. You you could actually heal I that vein. I, I have, I, I don't disagree with you and I've had some vocal, I had to go through some vocal rehab because I was had to perform at a certain point. Uh, for those of you yeah. on the restream, what it was, the, the mass Singer. And um, yeah, it's true. You can rehab stuff a lot. I, I, I did I did get it better, better, but it's still, it's, I can still tell it's not quite, it's a weird, feel, you know, it's a, so I, 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 I was thinking, we're going to go to break in a second, and uh, we're going to take calls from Clubhouse. I, I promise I'll take those, and, and I want to hear more Diana. Somebody but, wants to know if your mom was a singer. My mom? His mom. Yours. Mine was. I, I assume yours. He said wasn't his mom a singer. My mom, yeah, yeah. Um, way better than myself. Um, and, was and, your mom a singer, Stuart? <laughs> Um, no, well, I mean, apart from going to church, no, no, not a professional singer, no. I'm the only person in the family that, uh, you know, I was an actor originally, and then I became a voice coach in 1980. Um, so I'm the only person that actually fulfills this level of dimension. And it's, I'm, I'm, I'm flashing on, uh, well, I'm flashing on... <laughs> There's a series here called What We Do in the Shadows, and there's a gentleman on there that's a British actor that plays one of the vampires, and his voice is very much like yours. And whenever I see him, I think to myself, "Oh man, that guy had tons of vocal training at some point." It's all, and, I'm, and do they still do that for actors in Britain? They do a lot of vocal training. Immense amount, yes, but uh, yeah. you know that's yeah. all changing, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we 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 are renowned. Yeah. Just listen to Benedict yeah. Cumberbatch or Mark Rylance, yeah. you know. And, and I, we, we went on a segue, but I really want to come back to this really important, because I think you're going to be mind blown when I demonstrate to you what it is to find our signature notes. So we can come back to that. All right, we'll take a break. Come right back with that. That's what we'll do. Uh, be right back. I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Blue Mics. If you've heard my voice on this show any time over the past year, including right now, you've been listening to Blue Microphones. And let me tell you, after more than 30 years in broadcasting, I don't think I have ever sounded better. But you don't need to be a pro or have a fancy studio to benefit from a quality mic. You may not realize it, but if you've been working from home or using Zoom to chat with friends, you probably spend a lot of time in front of a microphone. So why not sound Sound your best. Whether you're doing video conferencing, podcasting, recording music, or hosting a talk show, Blue has you covered. From the USB series that plugs right into your computer to XLR professional mics like the mouse or the blueberry we use in the studio right now. Bottom line, there's a Blue microphone to fit your budget and need. I can't say enough about Blue mics, and once you try one, you will never go back. Trust me. To take your audio to the next level, go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients Plus, each single-serving easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great-tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink, it uses all-natural flavors, gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. All right, as I put my headphones back in again, we thank you guys for being here. We're here with Stuart Pierce. You can find out more about Stuart at stuartpierceback.com. And Stuart, you're a, a big hit with everybody. They're really enjoying 
hearing this, and now it's time for you to blow everyone's mind about the signature note. <laughs> <laughs> Live up. Sounds <laughs> evil. <laughs> okay, so your words, not mine. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just playing. <laughs> sort of, I love the way that you toss it back at me. Um, so if we imagine that the whole of my voice is here on a horizontal plane, rather like a keyboard, we know the thing about the keyboard is that it's actually the two, um, uh, what do we call them, two pitch ranges are identified by octaves. the middle. So what I'm talking about yeah. is what? Yeah, Octave, the, the, the two I'm octaves talking you're talking about? about yeah. I'm talking about treble. The, the full and keyboard. Bass. Full keyboard. Okay, got it. Yeah. Well, it's divided so middle by C. treble and bass. You know? So we yeah. have this yeah. note right in the middle, which we know is the harmonic balance of the piano. And as Dr. Drew just said, it's the middle C. Okay. Now, if I relate that to my voice, okay, so my voice is going to be sitting here. If I play with my right hand and my right hand alone, you get a lot of treble. But, uh, you know, mm. something's happened to my vocal structure, which maybe if I carry on talking to like this in the next five minutes, you're going to start complaining. And so uh, <laughs> for some reason, I'm only closing off uh, much of my voice and only using the top part, the treble. If I go right down here like this, if I carry on talking to you like this, you're probably going to fall asleep. And if you don't fall asleep, you're going to be concerned about me, maybe. But if I play with both hands, you get a mixture of the treble and the bass together. So there's infinite flexibility, even though it feels as though it's completely earthed. So there is my note. If I take the horizontal and make it vertical and put it into my spine, then the middle is mm. actually in one's and that's where Rumi gets this wonderful line from, so to speak. If words arise from the heart, they enter the heart. If words arise from the tongue alone, they don't pass beyond the ears. So that's uh. how we find our notes. So if we go back into the center of uh, you know, the heart chakra, go back into the center of the sternum, we balance up the whole of our bodies. But of course, what's interesting is that that also parallels with the way that I was talking about the breath. Because when the rib cage opens, we sit right in the middle of our beings. And I believe that's what mm. is meant by being centered. Interesting. Uh, you would love, uh, it's, a little, it's a little biological, but there's a guy named Stephen Porges that has worked out a phenomenon called the polyvagal theory. And it turns out that during development, you know, the branchial pouches, we, we look kind of like a a chicken you know when we're developing like a bird or something and, and we have these things called branchial pouches and each of them develops in a particular direction but they all have branches of the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve attaches our brain at the level of the brain stem to the heart it also hits the ear and it helps us tune our ear to vocal prosody and it creates vocal prosody through the use of our vocal cords it's literally a socio-emotional system for regulating the back and forth we call communication and it's it it, it, yeah. it it figures into facial musculature and gaze and this this whole thing that mm -hmm. goes on in how we understand other people's feeling states how we understand our own how it's expressed and reflected and then reflected back i mean it's a very elaborate uh, phenomenology but it it's at its core is the voice uh and mm -hmm. it's just sort of mm -hmm. interesting to me that we have spent a lot of time ignoring the voice uh in recent decades and it's nice to hear it's come back it's also interesting to me somehow with diana um back back to diana and your book and kayla put the book up again for any people newcomers um her poise and vocal command and use of language there it is poise vocal <laughs> command use of language i mean she had kind of the whole the whole show i love the, whole, the cover you like the cover but it, it were you working on her with working with her on all those things because i i really always thought should should you know it, i would i would use the word substantial that that when she would hit the podium she she always delivered something substantial but not um sensational because it, it didn't need to be she was it was sensational enough and it's in its quiet uh poise was that something that you worked on with her that was it, yes. I mean, I worked with her for the last two years. So I came along when she had been seen in the Martin Bashir BBC documentary that, of course, in recent times has 
has become highly controversial in the way that the BBC accessed Diana. And it's been proven by her brother, Earl Spencer, Charles Spencer, that um, it was nefarious the way that they accessed her. However, the point was mm -hmm. that what she said was extremely liberating for her because it was the first time that she revealed, well, there were three people in this marriage and I'm, I've had enough, so to speak. I mean, she didn't say I've had enough, mm -hmm. but we all gained mm -hmm. the, the impression that that yeah. was so. Um, so she felt yeah. liberated, she felt released as a result of it, and it was very daring and courageous of her. And as we notice in British history, when, when former wives of the Prince of Wales or indeed of the King of England has said something like that, they've lost their head, and Diana did not. Mm. I mean, that's a little mm. bit of a joke, obviously, <laughs> but, you know, but yeah, yeah, but I, but it, the, yeah, well, it. not metaphorically in, in recent years, but, but not so much uh, 200 years ago or before, but, but yeah, exactly. yeah that's, that's fascinating that, and, the, and she how, was able how, to maintain her status, she, her, 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 you know, her, she, in a way she was, you know, the, the documentaries or the, the, uh, the crown recently sort of implied that she was sort of at least as a public figure or a celebrity at the time, she was bigger than the crown. Well, she was loved by the people. This was, this was the major advantage, you see. The people's princess became the queen of everybody's hearts and literally undiluted adoration and love, as indeed she experienced when she, whenever she United States, whether it be um, New York initially, and that, that there was a frenzy about her first entry to New York, and then Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. of course I'm talking about her formal status. But what what was not successful for Diana in this expose of the Martin Bashir BBC documentary was the way that she was looking through the top of her eyes and using this mm. very very mm -hmm. light, breathy voice. I remember uh, that. Which may, yeah, yeah, which yeah. May, May have had sort of delicacy and gentleness and a feminine spirit, but she she didn't feel powerful. That was the most important thing. So what I did was to really allow her to feel, and she was very sportive. She was very alive in her body. You know, she was in a sensualist who was very very impactful in the vitality of her kinesthesia. So it was very easy to awaken her to the power of the breath and how she could just sit in the breath. Automatically, her voice opened. And that's the impactfulness that you were referring to just now. So thank you for that. I'm glad that you felt that. Yeah, I, well, I, it's funny. I, I'm I'm thinking. I I was not as I was not consciously aware of what you were describing until you brought it forward. And that is a hundred percent my previous image of her. I have, I have distinct images of her at the podium later and later on. But early on during the documentary and whatnot. Yeah, she seemed fragile and shrinking, and, 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 that, and that is quite much, quite in contradistinction to how I think of her at the podium later, which was, again, I don't want to use words like commanding, but but just exceptional poise uh, and clarity. Well, please, and did, did, go, did, go ahead. Please do, because we worked on being calm, commanding, and conscious. You know, one, in other words, that with the latter degree. She was often non-present because of nervousness, and I moved her into, helped her into being fully focused, so she was completely present. So how do you do that? That's my question. What did you, was it rehearsing things? Was it practicing things? Was it a oh, sure. coaching up? Can, yeah. 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 All, all example. of that. And the, and the above. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, a, yeah. it's firstly about becoming really present and focused, which is what you do so well. I mean, how most people just don't look to the people that they're speaking to and look at or look right. to. And, um, you know, if we're, if we're feeling shy or self-conscious because we're not, you know, because we're nervous, because we feel diminished in our temperament, the first thing we do is we look all over the place rather than being focused. Yes. Yeah, and even yes. with really senior CEOs, it's the first thing that I'm asking um, my clients to do. Could you just look at your audience and smile? <laughs> and so we worked on focus, and that took her all the way through the body in terms of being centered so that she could feel the weight of her body going through her feet into the floor beneath her. And we often use metaphysical images, you know, imagining, for example, that there was a light going through her spine into the earth. So she always felt supported through the gravity of Mother Earth. Most of my work is about finding weight and gravity so that the person feels really secure. And then we worked on the elongation, the method, phrasing, and rhythm, 
and um, you know, using particular words for emphasis, which always, of course, as you know so well, they always um, allow the audience's attention to be grabbed, so to speak, rather like the points of emphasis become coat hooks on which the fabric of the thought is hung. Um, and things back like that. to uh, back to Margaret Thatcher, I, I think about her genius with all that. I mean, it was that that I suspect you did not yeah. have to work on with her. <laughs> well, uh, what I showed Margaret was how she could use a rising inflection because she was always using a downward inflection. Da -da 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 -uh, da -da 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 -uh. And at the early days of her premiership, she was very easy to interrupt if she was being exercised by an international reporter. So what I showed her is how she could just literally keep, just suspend the thought in the air, recover the breath, and can suspend the thought in the air and recover the breath, and suspend the thought in the air. So it feels as though the person is never coming to an end. Therefore, they can't be interrupted. Oh, that's really interesting. That's another kind of memory I have of her. Uh, mm -hmm. I forget what she was asked once. I, I don't know why this stayed with me. Mm -hmm. uh, what was she asked? And she said, essentially, I don't know why I have the answer in my head, but I don't have the question. But she she left it with an upbeat, which was essentially, well, I think that was solved long ago by the, the Greeks, you know, the, the Stoics. The, the, the Greeks may solve those issues long ago. Uh, and uh, I don't know why that stayed with me with her. Um, the other thing is, so people have something to, to take away. Uh, you said, look at your audience and smile. Do you advise that you pick a person in the audience? Do you, does it depend on the size of an audience? Should, is it better to pick a clock at the back of the room? What, or does that just depend on the speaker? Never choose the clock. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a very old suggestion which really doesn't work. It just makes the person completely disembodied. I say look mm -hmm. at your audience. So now obviously if you're standing in front of 100 people, you can't look at all the 100 faces that are before you. But what's interesting is you look at one face and really speak to them. All of the people that are sitting around that individual will feel that you're speaking to them. But at least what yes. happens is that the flow of energy becomes deliberately focused, and that's the key. It's an interesting word, focus, because actually in Anglo-Saxon it means hearth, it means fire. And of course, as we all know, oh. that when there is light, when there is fire, and people come around, if you're burning a log fire, everybody looks into the fire, and conversation sometimes ceases. So it's about finding the light. How about movement? Do you recommend people stay behind a podium? Is movement across a stage, again, does that depend on the speaker? Yeah, it depends on the speaker, because a lot of people, when they move, they don't realize that it's actually quite a complicated process when you're standing in front of a thousand people you have to be really yeah. centered in your body yeah. so um and uh, you know obviously the podium if you are standing behind a podium it provides one with a pivot of security because you can hold on to it so again the body feels grounded and that automatically harmonizes or relaxes the individual so they feel more secure yeah yeah, it, it, I, I, I always have to have you because if you start to feel insecure, you can just get to that home base and you can stand behind, literally stand behind it. You can hide behind it a little bit and it gives you a sense of, of security in that moment. I, I've, I've also noticed that the, the makeup, and I've done a bit of public speaking uh, across several years, and I, I'm stunned at how much how much of an impact the room has on the ability to reach an audience. Uh, whether you have a proscenium or not, whether there's folding chairs or, or raked seats, and whether or not there's lighting that distinguishes you from the audience. Uh, these things make huge impact. And it's always just, it's and it's uncanny to me, but it, it really does. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, we're talking about the geometry of form, aren't we? You know that Goethe, the great yeah. German poet, said yeah. that all architecture is frozen music. And perhaps originally it was, you know, when you look into the extraordinary architecture of, well, when we go to cities like Philadelphia or New York, and to a certain extent San Francisco, we see architecture in the 19th century, which obviously was a, a deep memory of the architecture from before. We can see that it's full of, of pattern and form and music. Um, you know, I, I worked as, which is where I get my title from, Master of Voice, I worked through the reconstruction of Shakespeare's Globe Theatre, which was made solidly out of wood. 
And this is the theatre mm. that stands on the mm. south bank of the River Thames, where the original globe, re relatively speaking, would have stood. So we've actually used, in the building of it, um, original processes or techniques that furniture makers wow. or indeed wow. wood makers would have been would have used at that time 450 years ago so it holds <laughs> very very specific energy the wood that was used the oak is 450 years old so in other words it was oh a lie shakespeare's day and my joke always was that when i you know i actually went into the forest with the master woodsman to choose the oak for the first building uh, for the first um, um, area of the building. Uh, and I, I would like to think that Shakespeare's voice was actually in that oak. Oh, my God. Well, he certainly was speaking around that time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Susan, when, when he says that uh, the form of the city is frozen music and you think of New York City, is there a song that comes to mind? You, I don't want to put you on the spot. It's not a trick question. A song. I, um, is there any music come to mind? Because I think most people will say, uh, when it comes to New York City, they will they will say a specific song. That that when you think of the buildings and think of the skyline, and think of particularly the silhouette of the skyline. I'm usually from, pretty good at this. From Central Park, looking at West. What what do you think of? How could that know? New York, New York. I don't okay, know. well that'd be one of the songs I think people would think about. Uh, yeah. Stuart, do you know what I'm I'm angling for? All right. Well, All I right. think I think there's <laughs> a romantic mean. gesture going on here. <laughs> I think Susan just <laughs> needs to think romantically. He's a, he's a nudge. Th think romantically and think of the airlines the airlines we fly on oh, to get to oh, New York. Okay. <laughs> so, does um, that help? Um. Rhapsody in Blue. Rhapsody in Blue. Thank I think you. a lot of Rhapsody. Americans would think Rhapsody in Blue when, when they see New York skyline, um, which yeah, is interesting that. because well, <laughs> you, you don't. Okay. Because that's well, it's too Woody Allen for you. You, you. you disdain that. Yeah, that's kind of your thing. Yeah, but but I, I like do. like New York, New York. Yeah, I think that's another one. But but I think New York people State of mind, have that, said, that's a good one. that kind of mid early mid 20th century is where that some of that got captured let me i'm going to go to the phone take a couple of calls here um and let's mm. see if she, uh, my my callers have questions for Stuart. uh again i have this is uh yanni hi yanni hey thanks for inviting me up you bet i have a question um a personal question about about my voice i do storytelling meditation and astro traveling uh teaching people how to astro travel Ooh, cool. and just based on what you hear and what i do uh what do you, what would you recommend for me to improve my voice my tonality and tempo yanni i would purr <laughs> purr more be a cat purr and, and i'm curious you know why, I mean? why do you say that Yes, well, well I, because I, I, I my, mean, he, the, my French, my yeah. French teachers used to say that too, because that's where the French R is, and they'd always, they'd always encourage that. Well, if we purr, we suddenly become really relaxed, and throat becomes really open, and it becomes very mellifluous. So, if we're storytelling, as if there's a grave difference in. Once upon a time, there was a fairy prince and a fairy princess, and. Once upon a time, there was a fairy prince and a fairy princess, and one day they decided to go for a picnic down to the Tulgy Wood. The purring is magnetic. How's that, Did you get Yanni? that Yanni? Yes. Yeah, so I also write poetry, and when I read my poetry aloud, I use that voice, but I, I didn't think it was animated enough. Like, for instance, uh, love is life. When we live for love, life lives for us. But there's a scroll in our soul with all the answers we could ever look to know if we simply go within instead of without. It, it, more like that voice? Is that what you're talking about? Absolutely. That was actually amazing. It's the voice of your heart and not the voice of your intellect. So Ooh, put your heart into That's another voice. interesting point. Yeah. That's a good note. Oh, I thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm I'm humbled. I'm just hey. I'm just a little boy out here in Texas, and I uh, appreciate. I love your appreciate voice. Yeah, you, you do have a unique. You have a you have an appealing voice. It it already is appealing. So. I want to I want to ask her travel. <laughs> okay, we'll figure that out <laughs> some other day. Uh, How does that work? <laughs> let's get. Uh, let's get. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be doing a podcast with ICP who are interested in that kind of thing. Josh, what's going on? Hey, Dr. Drew. Hey. Um, I was just wondering if when the voice changes, does the personality change? 
And the reason why I ask that is because I've heard you talk about women who are very mature in age, mm-hmm. who have voices like yeah. their 10 or 11 year old girls. Yeah. And the reason when you, when you probe them was there was always childhood trauma at that exact age. Yeah. Yeah. And so if, if I have a voice and it changes, will my personality change or does he see that personality change also? A great question. Well, our, our voices are our personality, aren't they? That's why we, we, we speak of personality, meaning the quality of somebody's being. But the word persona means through sound. Very interesting. I, I, he's, he's referencing something that I noticed, which is I, I, when people are severely traumatized, their, their voice seems to stop maturing. They, they sort of, their part of them is stuck in that period and the voice reflects it. You can, you can, I, yeah. I, I recognize it cause I can shut my eyes and, and how and I imagine how old the person that's speaking, if I didn't see them, how would I imagine their age to be? And it's usually right there at the age they were traumatized. So our voices are purely physical means that we use to communicate our thinking and our feeling. So if the if our emotional body is so traumatized that our physiology moves into strictus, then automatically our voices are held at that time, sure. So most of my journey with people that have actually been through deep trauma in releasing their voices is by going deep into the behavior of that time in a very gentle, non-invasive way and mm-hmm. finding ways of being able to use sound mm-hmm. to release, you know, because they're not in harmony in the middle of the trauma. But if we, but speaking about it often allows an external being oh, such yeah. as myself move into harmony and then automatically the tears come which i consider to be a real blessing the trauma comes to the surface of consciousness and the physical stricture is automatically released that is fascinating because really the work of trauma is reintegrating and re-regulating and it makes sense yeah. to me that you could get there with them they're, they're the the way the brain deals with trauma we wall it off and we get stuck but it's not yeah. it's not as threatening as the the individual imagines it to be and uh, having an empathic connected person there to to share it to hold it for them with them that's that's really all it takes that's fascinating i am guessing that diana had a fair bit of that and because she's always struck me as someone who was in quite a bit of pain at least at one time in her life so i'm guessing that was something you must have had to dealt with with her oh sure sure and you know and, and as you well know that if somebody is repeatedly bulimic or repeatedly anorexic the physiology, particularly within the diaphragmatic muscle, becomes so constricted that often there's a lot of acid reflux, which automatically affects the voice. So it was a question of soothing and healing and gently, you know, of dealing tremendous amount of relaxation processes through breath, of slowing the breath down, of elongating the breath into flow so that the individual can move into harmony. And it slows down all of the adverse physiological effects that are taking place. Hold There's that book up that. again. I know, I know, Mrs. Pinsky is going to be reading that book. I, I saw, I saw the light in her eye. There it is. There's the book, Susan. There, I love I, Diana. I know, and I could, I could see you really enjoying this book. So, let's go get it for you. And anyone else interested? Uh, there it is. I mean, she's, she's someone that seems to uh, ignite a lot of interest. And I, I, I like that we're talking about it through this angle. It's a really interesting perspective, and it, it, it. It's very vivid in my own mind about her changes and who she was at the end there and the the immense stature and, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, poise, again, that she, she was able to maintain. Um, Stuart, I appreciate you I being here. Stuart this Stuart would be a great guest on Calling Out with Susan Pinsky. Uh, oh, <laughs> well, that's a different pod that you can invite <laughs> Stuart to. We'll do, a little, but, uh, we'll do a little astro travel. I work with psychic mediums. Maybe Princess Diana will pop by. Uh, I see. Hello. Do you have any other questions for him, Susan? No, I'm... I'm just, I was kidding around, but. but, I'm I'm looking at the restream, seeing if you guys have anything in the chat. Give me a second here to check all of this. This has been a really interesting conversation for us and different. Uh, Oh, come on, you guys. Was there ever anybody in the, in the Royal Palace that ever was delved into any kind of like psychic medium questions oh, like yeah. worked with any clairvoyance or anybody like that oh absolutely in fact the queen's mother queen elizabeth the queen mother she was a regular visitor to mediums 
Yeah, I mean, the royal family in, in private are very accessible for the spirit world. And when you look deeper into me, you'll see that much of my work is actually in relation to metaphysics. Oh. And, and where do we find that? Is that on your website or? Oh, I, I become, you know, I've moved away from hiding myself <laughs> because the corporate world would say, what do you mean you see angels? Um, but you'll you'll see I'm very brazen on stuartpierce.com, or you can go to theangelsofatlantis.com, and you'll see all about me. But it's primarily about using sound as a healing modality and empowering the people that um, very, very fondly walk onto my path. It, it's interesting to me that Susan, I did not pick that up about you, but Susan picked, picked it up automatically. That's, well, you can invite him back to your pot. I'm sure you guys will have an interesting... You know, it, people Let's really like it. this Let's... stuff, Drew. I know it. It, yeah literally I, I know they, do. they love they love this kind of thing look they all, just, all i know is the this thing i just in, only have a the, few naysayers this, that don't think you should be affiliated correct with you because you're and, so special and this thing under the calvaria is a limited instrument it design it evolved for a particular application and it has limitations and the fact that things exist beyond those limitations I have no difficulty accepting. Yeah, but you can't deny that you have not that you have never gone to a psychic. You've been because you all your friends are psychics. That's why you're and fellow. you're always and and you always jump in. Why not in every conversation and ask about sure. it? Sure, of course you do. Yeah, and and they're all really good. I mean, they're very good at their job, and you believe a lot of it. Sometimes you don't, but. Are you well? I I have to stay with the science, and that's I where know, I stay. I know. I think it's. Um, I think well, people are more open to it these days. You know, ten years ago it was a little different. Yeah, people well, are more. Into yeah, it. I know. Over it, the it, next it, ten years, a huge shift in consciousness because we're all asking such so. voluble questions about what is going on on our planet and what is happening inside me. You know, because a lot of people are really, really frightened, and many of the old skills or the old paradigms are really not satisfying the new way of being. So I'm sure we're going to see a tremendous, I mean, we're really talking about holism, aren't we? That we're going back to the original belief that physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, we are one. And one of the ways yes. of dealing with this, is really recognize the intelligence of the sentience of planet Earth and the universe. It's teeming in life. And angels just and happen to be part of that. Right. Angels are great. But if you look at British history, like it goes back so many years and there's so much history and, and faith. And I think that people in that ah, you know, there culture we are, are more open to it because they know that. Oh, there it is. What's that? That's uh, Stuart's website. Oh, cool. The, hey, this, these are all my books and Stuart. oracles. Let's do it, honey. I mean, I'd I love think, to. You, I think, we, we I think all, Stuart and I should have a podcast. He should be my host. All right. Uh, you guys go at it. I, I think it's very interesting. Don't you think he'd be great? <laughs> yes. Yes. You hook him up with Rebecca and Cindy. It would be very interesting Colby to see everybody. And all the fabulous. Uh, maybe we can get um, Tyler Henry and Lisa Williams. And Lisa Williams was a big um, British uh, star in the She was Australian, world. wasn't she? No. I, I thought she was British. She British? No, she's mm -hmm. British. I have an Australian one. I have a British one, and wow. I know it's just sort of Wonder a fun thing. I no, I know. I think you would be a great. I'd love to meet fun. them. I'd love to meet them. Yeah. Let's All right, you guys. And then you can talk to Diana again. And we're gonna her. let you guys give her heads up. We're gonna let you guys do that on your own time. I'm gonna wrap this up. <laughs> I'm gonna wrap up the clubhouse. Thank you guys for stopping by. It was a privilege. Uh, and we are going to say farewell to Stuart, who will be back with Susan Pinsky in an upcoming date, no doubt. And are you in New York now? Is that where you are? Or are you in London? No, I'm in London. Yeah, it's 12 o'clock at okay, night. Okay, London. So we can't... Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, no, Susan may be... Thanks for staying up for us. We really appreciate it. Drew, it's it. a great yeah. honor coming on. You know, when I discovered that I was being invited on, I just couldn't wait to meet you. It's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you very deeply from my heart for inviting me on it's been a great Thank pleasure your meeting publicist you. for sending us an email whoever it was i don't yeah know it is our pleasure jeremy. and we yeah. enjoyed it I th oh it was jeremy it was jeremy yeah jeremy is the best people yeah I jeremy is it. really interesting people and when he said i trust him when he says you should talk to this guy and he's not been wrong yet so uh, we thank you for being here. We'll get the book, and we'll see you back when you and Susan, uh, maybe when you're in New York, Susan, you can set up a you know a thing with you know what I mean, like because there'll be less less time change for him then. 
Something get, like that. Get Khalees and uh, Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Okay, guys, thank you so good. much. Thank you, Stuart, stuartpierce.com. And uh, I will see you all tomorrow when we have the great Vinny Tordrich in here to talk about his new documentary, which I think you'll find very, very interesting. And we have on Thursday. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm watching the restream. Yeah. There, we have like this sort of your mom's house, predominantly male uh, fan base on yeah. YouTube. And they're like, shh, okay, stop it. You're not going to talk about this. <laughs> Jebediah, like Jebediah Bila on Thursday from, she was a Fox News host. Uh, I think Sorry, she has a book out and Vinnie Tordrich tomorrow. Uh, and then uh, we're already setting up next week. I saw some interesting, oh, Annadel Barber's coming in next week. Jason Waller next week. So we have lots of good stuff coming. And, uh, Sorry to mean to interrupt. But... Great. And uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Caleb. And we will see you all tomorrow at three o'clock. Okay, you need to put a little pile of salt on mm -hmm. all the outside doors. No, so, so not start. every door, but the entrance doors. You can do it. You can do it each door if you want. Like we have some in the playroom. Oh, I, yeah. I, His we, life is too short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 273 8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash.